I will be talking about uh, practically harmonizing Sentinel-2 data uh, according to Nadir Biardiev at JotPens. So this is very useful for people who is doing actually analysis uh, that require this kind of uh, satellite imagery, especially with different acquisition times. Uh, this is really important and also if you are, for example, working with data cubes, this will also help you uh, a lot on it. It's based on Python, so if you're working on Python, this will be, uh, can be very helpful for you. So I will uh, start saying what we're going to talk about. So first, a little bit of introduction to Sentinel-2 BRDF and the C-factor method for getting a BRDF adjusted reflectance. Then we go to a little part of data cubes and then we end uh, with the tool that we are going to present here, which is sent to NBAR for getting the Nadir BRDF adjusted reflectance or NBAR uh, for Sentinel-2 data cubes, actually. So just starting with Sentinel-2, well, I guess we must, uh, most, most of us know what Sentinel-2 is, uh, then we have a collection of two satellites out there with the multispectral instrument uh, getting a, a very high resolution, actually public high resolution uh, satellite imagery in different um, bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for example, we have here uh, the bands of Sentinel-2 and then we can see that for example we have 10 meter bands in RGB and also the near infrared. Then we have 20 meter bands in the red edge, also a little bit of narrow near infrared and the short wave infrared bands. And then we have 60 meter bands uh, for aerosols, uh, water vapor, and this one for cirrus. Uh, and this is just the into the Sentinel 2. So uh, it's very, it's a very useful uh, data set. And then we go to BRDF, and for BRDF, we get the definition of bidirectional reflectance distribution function. And it is going to describe uh, how actually reflectance changes according to the uh, view and sun angles. So uh, we usually kind of expect that uh, the reflectance is just like the sun get a sensor radiation and then the sensor is going to receive this one. But this actually depends on a lot of other factors. So it's not the same and this changes according to where the satellite is, where the sun is and a lot of other uh, surface characteristics. So reflectance is different according for where you look at it. Uh, and fortunately in 2000, for the MODIS actually sensor, there was developed, uh, well, there, were, there, there was tested um, BRDF model, a kernel-based BRDF model that is practically the sum, sum of different kernels or scattering mods. In this case, in this case the isotropic, uh, the volumetric, and the geometric kernel, uh, uh, they are going to actually describe different parts of or this, the different components of the BRDF, like uh, this is uniform scattering, this one is going to depend more on the kind of medium where the, the light is gonna be, get scattered, and this one is going more into how geometric, uh, big geometric objects are going to interact with the light and the shadows are the position and things like this. So these three are spectral parameters that can be derived, if it can be accepted for each one of the kernels. And these two are actually the kernels that like depend on the solar zenith angle, uh, on the view zenith angle, which is uh, one of the sensor or the satellite, and also the view sun relative azimuth angle, which is the difference between the azimuths of the view and the sun uh, azimuth angles. So this is the, the intro to BRDF. And then the C-factor method. Uh, the C-factor method is just an algorithm, a very easy algorithm that uh, uses this BRDF model to adjust the surface reflectance to Nadir BRDF adjusted reflectance. This started with these two papers by David P. Roy, uh, and he developed this method for Landsat using the previously shown uh, MODIS BRDF model. And it does the following. We have here uh, the sensor, the sun, and we have the corresponding angles. So this is the view zenith angle, this is, this is the zenith, this is the zenith, and this is the view zenith angle, this is the sun zenith angle, then we have the solar azimuth here, this is the north line, this is the south line, 
and we have here the view uh, azimuth. Now, the difference of these two is the relative azimuth, and what this algorithm does is practically take this sensor and put it on Zenit, right? So we have for all our acquisition times or our acquisition images uh, always this adjusted nadir view. So actually our images can be comparable across time. And he does this in a very, actually, easy way. So this is, for example, a, the M bar for example, at a specific band. And as you can see, this is just a, a, a scaling factor against the normal sur surface reflectance of that specific band. And this is the C factor. And here it's very cool because the C factor is just the ratio of the BRDF model that we just presented before but between uh, the numerator being set uh, to zero in the zenith angle. So in that way, the BRDF model that we can compute here uh, can be used to actually adjust all of the images that we want to actually use for our analysis. And that's how we can get that BRDF adjusted uh, reflectance. This was done for Landsat, but uh, Oh, sorry, this was, this, was, this was done for Landsat, and then the, par the spectral parameters uh, were retrieved from the MODIS uh, spectral parameters, so we have them here. And then this was extended to Sentinel-2. And in Sentinel-2, we just used the same Landsat spectral parameters, and additionally, we add the ones for the red edge. So these, ones were, uh, these other ones were just generated based on this. Uh, uh, Landsat spectral parameters that were derived from MODIS2. So, uh, here you can see, for example, how it changes uh, when you use surface reflectance or Nadir Beard uh, reflectance data. This is surface, this is adjusted, and this here is the difference. You can see that this is the, uh, the end of one of the swaths, and this here is the difference of these two, and then you can see that there are actually effects that we have to consider here, or why is the reflectance values that we have there in these intersecting sections, if we want, want to do analysis, well, they can get, they can get mess, messed up if we don't correct that. That's not negligible. So that's pretty important if we, for example, want to work with data cubes in, um, as it was previously uh, shown in, in the in two talks ago. I mean, data cubes are aligned with a spatial temporal grid, right? So, Earth system data cubes are just multidimensional arrays of Earth system data that, are, ha, that, that have their own dimensions, uh, a set of grids, data, and attributes. And in the set of grid, grids, we have the space and we have at the time, and we have the time. And a very important part of the Earth system data cubes well, are Earth observation data cubes. And this is even more relevant now because we can easily get uh, data cubes like using, for example, specifications like a stack. And if we have uh, data stored in stack and then we, use, we can use different tools to get actually uh, the data from a stack and actually converting them as a Earth observation data cubes in Nets array, we can analyze uh, large quantities of data in space and in time. But before analyzing that, it's very important actually to correct by these effects, uh, these effect, effects before. So that's why uh, we went and uh, started the creation of this tool. Uh, the tool is called Send to Ember. This one is open source, it's available in GitHub. If you want to install it, well, you can just do pip install send to Ember. Or if you are using Conda, you can also go Conda install from Conda Force, from the Conda Force channel. It's also available there. And it works in a very simple way. Uh, it, it works, oh, can do it here too. It works with safe files, like if you have your own uh, Sentinel 2 level 2 April, which is surface reflectance. Uh, it actually gets all the data that it needs for computing this factor and computing the Nadir BRDF adjusted reflectance using the metadata and the actual values of it. So it's going to use the granular metadata to actually do the C factor computation. Uh, and then it's going also going to use the, 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 the oh, sorry, 
the safe metadata to extract also the processing baseline. This is important, uh, so we can actually harmonize Sentinel-2 uh, first because if you remember, after processing baseline number four, uh, all the reflectance values are shifted. So we have to shift this before uh, doing the, the correction. Then the C factor is interpolated according to the spatial, spatial resolution of each one of the bands, and then the M bar is just calculated itself and saved in the same safe file. But also, uh, we have here for data cubes. And in this case, for data cubes that are computed or are extracted via a stack. So the idea is that if we have a data cube uh, with multiple bands and multiple time steps uh, and our specified bounding bots, we can use this data cube to go into the stack uh, where we created it from and then we get the metadata from it. We do the, com the computation of the C factor for all of the time steps that were included there. We also extract the processing baseline so we can actually harmonize the data cube first, first. And then we do the interpolation of the C factor to create the M bar computation, but this is done for the entire data cube uh, according to the resolution that you have and also according to the reference system that you have and also for the bands that you have. It doesn't have to be all of them if you don't need to. And all of this is computed uh, using X array. And if you have it with a, as, a, as a lazy array with Dask, uh, it can be computed in parallel too. So uh, from behind, this is doing this. This is just getting the metadata. And then from the metadata, it's just getting the Zenit and Nasimut view angles. And also from the sun, is getting the Zenit and Nasimut angles. From this, is then computing the kernels. In this case, just the geometric and the volumetric kernel because the isometric, uh, isotropic one is uniform. Uh, and then using the spectral parameters that were derived from David Roy papers, uh, we can compute the BRDF model. In this case, this is the Rosli BRDF model that I showed at the beginning. And then from this one, uh, the C factor is just computed just uh, in a very quick way using a multidimensional arrays. Now, it is just as simple as multiplication, as doing the multiplication between the C factor and the surface reflectance for getting the Nadir BRDF, uh, adjusted reflectance for your whole data cube. And well, how to do it? Well, for safe files, it's very simple. You just import from send to mbar, mbar, um, underscore safe, and then you just used this function. And then you put here the path to your safe file, and it's going to do the whole computation. But if you want to do it, for example, with uh, data cubes that you created from stack stack, this is, for example, one from planetary computer and using stack stack, uh, you just do your whole pipeline, pipeline as you used to. Uh, you get your endpoint collection, the bounds, then you do the, you open your catalog with the PyStack client, and then you define the area where you want to, where you want to get the data cube from, and then you do the search, get all the items, and then retrieve this stack of images using a stack, 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 stack. And then for converting it to Nadir BRDF, just a reflectance, you just have to use this. MBAR uh, underscore stack, stack. And then uh, you put here in a stack your data cube. Then you put the endpoint, because we have to tell the, the function where to get uh, the metadata from. So it's going to get, it's going to go to this exact same endpoint and get the metadata to compute the C factor. And also, uh, what, what is the name of the collection? So it can go to it and easily compute everything. And then it's going to return another data array uh, with the corrected values. And this is another example using Kubo. Uh, Kubo is just a high-level wrapper for creating AI-focused data cubes. And by AI, I mean uh, data cubes which uh, the spatial dimensions, the lengths of the spatial dimensions are the same. Like, for example, you usually in AI models use image patches or chips where you use 128 pixels by 128 pixels, for example and different time uh, dimensions, uh, different time lengths. Uh, this is doing this. Who is just a package that creates data cubes also from a stack, but just with a, a dim special dimensions of equal length. And then for this one, it's just uh, using this function. From send to mbar that mbar, you import mbar uh, underscore kubo, and then you put your cube there. And then it's going to return uh, the same data cube, but corrected. And 
these are the three main functions. And just to, to tell you uh, how important it is, uh, let's check a little bit the effects on reflectance in just one single cube. This is a, a n bar composite of RGB for a single cube in a forest site. And then the rest of things that you are seeing here are the differences between surface reflectance and Nadir BRDF adjusted reflectance. And for example, you can see that, for example, for RGB is maybe not uh, that big, the effect or the difference, but when you start uh, getting close to near infrared, for example, red edge one, red edge two, red edge three, and near infrared are pretty much affected uh, by the by the by the BRD effects. Maybe not that much in in a space in this case because this is a very small cube. It's just like a 200 by 200 pixels. But if you can see the temporal dimension, which is this one here, you can see that there are pretty uh, big differences. And if you want to do temporal analysis, it's very important to consider this into into to consider this in your analysis. And also, not just in reflectance itself. If it's in reflectance and then you get derived products from it, like for example, vegetation indices, you will see also that there is an effect, but it will depend also in the index. Like if, for example, you have here in DVI, and DVI is almost not affected by it because it's normalizing everything. But if you have other indices that are actually not that normalized, uh, you will start seeing the effects more, uh, more greatly. Like, for example, this is near infrared reflectance of vegetation. Uh, it's a little bit more affected. When you use the kernel in DVI, you start seeing more points, even in space and in time, that are getting affected. And as I showed you before, the red edge was pretty much affected by it. Uh, this is the inverted red edge chlorophyll index that uses that uses the, uh, all the three red edge bands in combination with the near infrared. And if you check the, the, in the, the, the differences between the uh, index uh, using MBAR and using surface reflectance, well, you see that the, that the differences are actually pretty big here. And if you are using spectral indices, uh, maybe it's a good idea also to do the corrections before uh, performing your analysis. So. Uh, that's for for that's all now. Now for finishing, uh, just I just wanted to say the final remarks. We are the effects in Sentinel-2 imagery are not negligible. Uh, we should correct this. Uh, the C-factor method can be used com to convert a uh, surface reflectance to Nadir BRDF adjusted reflectance, and this will minimize the BRDF effects. And that's why we developed Sent to Ember, which is an open source Python tool that uses the C-factor method for convert for converting the surface reflectance of Sentinel-2 to Nadir BRDF adjusted reflectance. And finally, uh, Sentinel-Ember works with single safe files, but it also works for data cubes that were created from cloud store uh, stack data catalogs. And with that, I just want to say thank you. also been fantastically in time. Make use of the time. <laughs> uh, do we have questions? We have uh, lots of time for questions. Uh, thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, I was looking at the methodology of adjustments, and it seems that it really needs to be done. What is your take? Should it be done centrally? Like, for example, uh, on Copernicus store, they should distribute already adjusted imagery? As we know that they're they are producing products which are already like more user-friendly, and this seems like a thing that shouldn't we be doing on each computer on our own, because it could be done just once and published like ready data and so on. Sorry, can you repeat at the beginning of the question? It was pretty hard to hear you from here. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, do you think that this adjustment should be done centrally, like by ESA, on uh, and distributed for the Copernicus data store instead of uh, like that we just download the files and run it again and again and again mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so on? I mean, that would be great. Yes, <laughs> but. Uh, that depends also in the user. I mean, this is just one algorithm, right? And there might be others there, and people developing other things, right? So I think at the end, this is more a 
choice of the user on what to do. And this is one tool that goes for it in a simple way for data keeps, for example, and also for the files that they um, deliver in the level 2A product. But uh, it will depend, I think, more on the user side. More questions? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, maybe to extend a bit on like the, the previous question, um, can you? I'm definitely not an expert on BRDF, but since you are, can you extend a bit on like the state of BRDF in the community? Like, what are the biggest remaining challenges? Why? Ha why is there no like official product? Um, published, for example, right? Okay, I mean, the, actually the only feature product that I know is the modis one. <laughs> they they have an uh, embar and it's using the BRDF model that I presented at the beginning. It's a, actually a pretty simple model. It, it, it just has like three components uh, and they actually do not consider, for example, different land core types and how are they influencing the BRDF effects uh, and many other things. So it's actually not that simple to have a BRDF model, and this one is a very simplified one of what we can get. Um, so that's also why I say maybe it's, it's not on part of, for example, ESA saying, okay, we delivered this one, and that's it. Um, but it's probably a whole branch of research, <laughs> and just also on the specific uh, sensor. I mean. Thank you. We still have uh, one or two, or well, three more minutes. Hello. I would like to ask, is the Landsat data and Sentinel-2 data similar? Because they have the different if, if they use the filters. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Um, is the Sentinel-2 uh, data and Landsat-8 data similar if you use this um, processor, processing? Okay, you're asking if Landsat and Sentinel-2 are using like the same? No, if, if, they, are, if they are similar, if they are similar enough to use. Ah, okay, those? okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't say they are exactly similar. <laughs> They share probably similar bands, but they are also not. They also don't have the same spectral response function for it, for each one of the bands. So, uh, how this algorithm was developed for Landsat, uh, it can also be used for Sentinel-2. Uh, it's also dependent on the fact that it's also dependent on the reflectance values itself and its scaling reflectance values. And in that case, it kind of uh, serves to harmonize both. Uh, using, in this case, for example, the same model. Yeah, but all of them are actually based on the spectral parameters of the BRDF model of MODIS. <laughs> it's just a combination of a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that is, a, that is a tricky situation still, yes. although the, there's some projects going on that try to align the mm -hmm. latest, the la the latest land that and, and Sentinel ones, but the frequencies, the spectra are not comparable d directly, so the numbers are usually, it's not, you cannot just use one thing and uh, play with the other. They, you have to be always a bit careful there. Yeah. yeah, but it's getting, it's getting better. I mean, there's all this research in, in the data fusion, and, mm -hmm. but that would be again a different mesh, yes. mesh and mix, and then you would have to recalibrate it again differently. Okay. Um, um, how much of your day do you code? A day. <laughs> I just when I need it. Huh? Just no, need it. of your normal work day. Sorry? How much time of your normal work day do you spend coding? Oh, things like this. Uh, well, coding most of the time, like 90% of the time, I code. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, uh, I mean, if you have another question. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't see that. Um, I want to go back with the previous question a bit. I didn't completely understand. Uh, like Sentinel-2 uh, has two different platforms, so can I use this to really compare then the, the, the results? 
for these two platforms, A and B. Do you want to compare results against yeah, Lancet? Yeah, exactly. So you have you now had uh, the differences with Lancet and Sentinel because they're different platforms, so you have to be careful in, in the comparisons with this method. But now you have that for Sentinel with two different platforms. I didn't quite understand how that then works. Um, I'm not pretty sure I understood the question. <laughs> I think um, then maybe for clarification, then we can try to find each other in the, yeah. in okay. the break then.